And before we start today with our two speakers, I just wanted to say a quote by Vivekananda. He had this to say on yoga. This is no child's play, no fad to be tried one day and discarded the next. It is a life's work, and the end to be attained is well worth all that it can cost us to reach it, being nothing less than the realization of absolute oneness with the divine. So now I'll introduce Dr. Naveen Visweswaraya. He's an associate professor at Vyasa, India, and co-PI, ICMR, and he will be speaking about Yoga Kshema, Stress and Lifestyle Clinic, a working model of integrative medicine in Bengaluru, India. In this session, we will see how this integration is done and what it takes for, the health, for a healthcare provider to provide such a model and how it helps the patient heal faster. Please welcome Nav Dr. Naveen Visweswaraya. Not an academic presentation, this is more uh, to share our experience of uh, our attempt to test this concept, as they say, proof of concept in, 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 in executing an integrative medicine center in India. Uh, the background being uh, most of you who are in traditional medicine uh, at large here, and for us in India, Indian medicine, uh, we do know that the, globally there is a transition uh, from referring these bunch of therapies or strategies or medicine, systems of medicine, as alternative to complementary and then now to integrative. Now, the, the progress has been that physicians, medical community at large, has recognized that this is important and we need to combine and look at joint strategies. Yes, here we have slides. Uh, from somewhere it's coming though, so which is nice. <laughs> so, so this is the, uh, as I told you, uh, two organizations uh, which has come about to test this concept of integrative medicine in India. Uh, I'll talk about both of them in subsequent slides. Uh, now the current scenario is that world scientific and medical community has woken up. And we have these three declarations, which supports the agenda of uh, a very aggressive, comprehensive approach to, to combat NCDs across the world, both in developed and developing world. Uh, now, we do know that non-communicable diseases spread across large uh, number of uh, medical disciplines. And these are specific disorders that I have put in here, which are important to us uh, in two ways. One. Uh, that these are the, the prevalence of these disorders are very, very high, and we have considerable evidence for each of them uh, in most of the Indian medicine and, uh, and of course, an in integrative approach for those therapies that we want to use appropriate to these, uh, we have considerable evidence. Now, this is something that, that we have to remember, and this is going to go up every passing day. Now, that brings us to Indian scenario. How are we different compared to the global scenario? Uh, uh, the news is not so such a good news because we still are battling starvation deaths and we, are, we have large number of obese children and adolescents and adults. And then we are still now already declared with largest number of diabetes mellitus patients, every sixth Indian apparently is pre-diabetic or diabetic. And uh, soon we will have largest number of heart patients for any given country in the world by 2020, uh, but then we're still battling large number of infectious diseases. So here is a country where we are trying to work with disorders, classical disorders of developing world and of developed world. So, so that means the healthcare burden on a country uh, with 1.2 plus billion population. So we can imagine the, uh, the burden. Now, so this is of course an academic record. Now, if you want to look at a more progressive, proactive strategies to, to deal with them, uh, one of the basic things that is required is to know the impact of these disorders in terms of morbidity and mortality. And uh, this is very central record. And this is an interesting fact that I picked up from WHO report, that India is one amongst those really, really uh, underdeveloped countries which does not announce or declare official records of death. Although it's not a good news for us, uh, I thought it's important. Uh, we really have to start from somewhere there. Now, I did say this as a background. 
So now we have reached this situation where uh, mainstream medical community rather than traditional or Indian medicine community is interested to, to bring these two together. Now, there are a whole lot of uh, very significant movements. Uh, now, these are the uh, recognized bodies for different disorders, and these are the themes uh, either in, uh, currently in operation or has been in the last three years. Or in this case, for example, Diabetes Federation came up with the five-year common theme for the first time in their history with one simple theme called physical activity. And uh, WHO had two consecutive years where they just talked of bringing people outdoors and making people move. So, so the whole lot of general lifestyle agenda uh, in the minds of these professional organizations. Now, there is an organized medical uh, movements and academic progress in, in these disciplines and the prefix is increasingly being added. And now we see in, uh, there are departments uh, which are integrative uh, to any of these. And when in universities in North America, Australia, and, and some countries in Europe start to think of uh, an integrative medicine, they tend to specialize in any one of these areas. And that's how these prefixes just added, and then a bunch of adjunct professors from these disciplines join together and start uh, integrative medicine centers. For example, Stanford is known, a uh, world-known center for aging and health and use of traditional medicine in aging studies. Uh, now, these initiatives are very well structured. We have centers for integrative medicine within the medical schools or universities. There are journals of integrative medicine, the professional associations. One of the first ones to start is integrative oncology. You can imagine why. And the government policies for integrative medicine. And of course, this is something which is central for us to move on, also being uh, talked about. So for today, for our purpose, uh, our focus will be just talking about center because we are talking about one such center in India. Now, the starting point obviously would be evidence. In fact, Dr. Nagaratna did mention this in her talk that do we have, have, have we reached, got to a stage where we can talk of this? Do we have enough evidence? And where do we stand in terms of Indian medicine compared pitched against other traditional medicine? Now this table will give us that answer now look at the number of studies as on today morning, 9 a.m. We have 1983 studies in yoga. Uh, we have a lot more studies in meditation because there are a lot other forms of meditation other than yoga based. And of course, massage therapy, there are 10,000 plus, chiropractic 5,000 plus. Uh, not many because this is uh, not also much available in North America, mostly in Australia and, and UK, if at all. Now, Ayurveda 2,000 plus, to close to 3,000. Now these are the numbers to watch out for. Now if you really look at the status in, 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 in here, in India, uh, it's, it's a different scenario. But globally, when you compare acupuncture and Chinese medicine with yoga and Ayurveda, we get the answer straight away. So Chinese medicine, we have close to 70,000 papers. Traditional Chinese medicine, apparently that's the name given to herbal, comp herbal medicine component of Chinese medicine, so close to 24,000, and acupuncture close to 18,000. Now, if you compare that with yoga and Ayurveda, we're not even 10%. So that's the reason why uh, yoga today, in the eyes of medical community, is still a fitness strategy, not a healing system, and uh, Ayurveda is still a food supplement and not a healing system. Uh, and and all of us in India are not very happy with the fact that from 2010, Ayurvedic products are banned officially in European Union. Uh, so, so that's because, you know, uh, we don't have enough studies to back what we're saying. Uh, now, is there any success story and is there any uh, model that we can embrace? Yes, if Chinese have done it, their acupuncture, which is a lot more subtler, there's no body work, there's no breath work, there's no mind component. We are talking about subtle life energy channels and pricking some of the points, supposedly energy points, and then looking for clinical benefits. Is a healing system, as opposed to a lot more uh, pragmatic, tangible body, breath, mind work. Yoga is a fitness strategy. Now, traditional Chinese medicine, I'm sure some of the Ayurvedic physicians here will agree, 
uh, will have probably one-fifth of the herbs uh, in their pharmacopoeia as compared to Ayurveda. And the, the concepts of uh, human body, health, disease is a lot more mature than that of Chinese medicine. But still, it is, is nowhere near to that of a healing system. Now, what Chinese did, here is a China model. Uh, again, some of the administrative details which, which propel this kind of progress. 50 years ago, India, Indian government passed an act where they decided to keep Indian medicine outside the mainstream medical infrastructure. They said, we'll have them separate uh, in terms of education, regulation, and clinical practice and services. Uh, whereas China, around the same time, probably plus or minus three years, passed an amendment said every single medical infrastructure, be it college or hospital, should have traditional Chinese medicine unit. And they started incentives programs. And about 15 years ago, Chinese government did something very smart. They created a global endowment for Chinese medicine research of $1 billion each year. And specifically, this grant was used for North American and European universities, which is why we have American Journal of Chinese Medicine which came up well before Chinese journals. So, so they really saw the fact that keeping traditional medicine within the ambit of mainstream medicine is the way to go. And unfortunately, we didn't do it, and, and we have the results before us. Okay, now, are we ready to take this approach? Is it the right way to go? I personally think yes, because we are, there's no way other than generating evidence, uh, critically evaluating traditional medicine and embracing them into the mainstream medicine. So, which is why, although I am a full-time faculty in a yoga university and I've spent more than 15 years studying yoga uh, in the context of neuroscience, I said a couple of years from now on, we should spend time. W what is the use of, let's say, SVSR or as a whole, out of 2,000 plus papers, uh, in meditation and close to 2,000 papers in yoga, even if we have half of them coming from India, the reality is, which is also reality here, uh, that these research studies are not accessed by yoga therapists or yoga instructors. So they don't, do, you, they don't use it on their daily basis, on their daily classes, either for well, wellness or healing purposes. So therapists or instructors do not use this. Patients do not know about this. Physicians, except those who are researching these traditional medicine or Indian medicine, don't use them. So it's more an academic activity for us than actually turning it into an evidence-based practice. So which is why we founded this with Dr. Shirley Tellers, myself, and two other colleagues. We decided that we'll start an organization which will first take up the activity of assessment. Now, you can't not critically evaluate any of these systems before you think of integration. Now, uh, this is important uh, to address two groups in, in two, 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 two distinct domains. I think I have it there, okay, so let me say that here. Now, assessment is, is for Indian medicine or traditional medicine institutions and physicians. Uh, I give this analogy to people uh, when I talk to Indian medicine professionals that it's like our monsoons. We are very, very accustomed to the having floods every year after every monsoon. And really uh, don't think of using the, the, the flooding waters uh, to combat the drought which is going to come just after that. So, so we have large number of Ayurvedic physicians, yoga physicians, naturopathy physicians, and others with thousands of col uh, institutions, hundreds of organized colleges treating so many patients, we really don't have any data of that clinical experience. So these uh, clinicians and institutions need to be trained in research methods. Government of India allocates close to 50 crore rupees for research training of Indian medical physicians every year. Uh, I don't know what, uh, a quick, uh, some of you can do that quick translation of that money in dollars. Now, that is one part and that has to, uh, that is an ongoing process. Now integration, now, we have these 2,000 papers in yoga. Uh, to take an example of diabetes, because that's a prevalent disorder in India, there are close to 80 plus papers in yoga and diabetes. And if I run a survey of endocrinologists, 
I don't think even 10% of endocrinologists will know anything about these, these papers. So which means there is evidence that people who are testing this, there is a specific module for yoga, of yoga for diabetes, but nobody is knowing and using it. So we need to go out to these people, like China did, and say that, look, there is enough evidence for you to get started. If not conclusive, there is enough to get started, and it's only here in the mainstream hospital that we can generate or, or robot Evidence, robust evidence. So that fitted into a nice acronym called FAITHS. So the Indian medicine or traditional medicine, which is also referred to as faith healing, uh, uh, is no longer will be faith healing. Now, FAITHS has multiple domains uh, as its objectives. Uh, three of them main objectives being uh, research, education, and clinical services. Although uh, for me and Dr. Shirley, the priority is education and research. And we have done large number of education programs for Government of India for under this organization with FAITHS and SVASA. In fact, mo most of them are housed in SVASA, although it was executed by FAITHS. Uh, now, when we started to talk to these physicians in Bangalore, virtually in more than 10 corporate hospitals, um, I'm saying this particularly, uh, there is a structured program for public or uh, government-run hospitals, what is called mainstreaming of Ayush where they're trying to integrate Indian medicine with main conventional medicine. But our private medical uh, health care providers, which, is, which amounts to 90% of our health care uh, provision, uh, they, they are not connected to these this government initiatives. So when we started to talk to these people who are our research collaborators, they say it makes sense, but we don't know how it works, so we need to see a prototype. And that's what propelled the birth of Yoga Kshema. Uh, yoga Kshema, for some of you who are not familiar, uh, it's not a yoga, the word yoga is not used in the context of yoga uh, the way you, we use in yoga. Yoga here is acquire. So uh, from our birth to death, we are acquiring human experience. It could be matter, ma material, or people, or any human experience. And whichever is good, we want to preserve them, and that is Kshema. So we're busy acquiring good experiences and preserving them. And one of the major domains of that acquire and preserve is, is health. So, so that's how the World Yoga Kshema was chosen. And now, did, should we call this an integrative medicine center? We said it's going to be premature. In India, integrative medicine would be, uh, would be a very new, naive, unknown name for many, many patients and professionals. So we said, uh, let's give it a name which is little more uh, uh, easy for people to understand. A central problem in this is stress and lifestyle, and the solution has to come in dealing with stress and lifestyle. So we said we'll call this as a yoga kshema, a stress and lifestyle clinic. Now, this logo is evolved uh, to, to incorporate what is categorized, classified in WH1 and NIH and in ICMR as the entire global traditional medicine is classified into four, four of these. Conventional medicine, herbal medicine, energy medicine, mind-body medicine. So pretty much all therapies can be tucked into any of these four. So the future medicine, which is integrative medicine, needs to have equal component uh, of all of these. Now the setting. So we have conventional medical setting, and the yoga kshema serves as a daycare setting. The daycare setting has a different connotation here. It's OPD, outpatient clinic in India, is what referred to as daycare. And we have Vyasa, the Prashanti Kutram uh, University campus and attached 200 bedded hospital. And we have another uh, holistic health center that has come into our fold, uh, uh, which also serves as an inpatient setting, which, is, which I refer to as a retreat setting. Uh, uh, this is a, so there are a few photographs here uh, to give you visualization of this place. Uh, one of the prominent ministers of state of Karnataka inaugurating the clinic. Uh, this is inside, and you'll see some of the familiar faces, Dr. Shirley, Dr. Nagaratna. This is how it looks. It's a 4,000 square feet area on a very prominent, a very centrally located place in a very distinguished area of ba city of Bangalore. A bit like Palo Alto, I would say probably Palo Alto of Bangalore. And, and, and we're very happy to have this place from a philanthropist who is kind of tracking my career for 20 years. And one fine day, he, in, uh, in virtually about 7 o'clock, a dark evening, he brings me and tells me that this used to be a FedEx godown 
for 14 years because the old airport was pretty close to this place. And says, this belongs to some of our friends in US. The owner of this place is a doctor, a urologist. And this was built to be a neurology clinic when he became doctor by his father. But he chose to come and practice in US. He says, now my friend says this should be used for medical purposes. And do you want to use this? And I said, are you really serious? There's no way that I can afford a 4,000 square feet place. So he says, no, no, this is for your trust. So you really don't have to worry about commercials of this. And that's how we got this place. And uh, we're close to now six months, seven months in this. Uh, so, okay, now how have we structured this clinic? So we have specialty consultations, uh, which is with conventional and traditional medicine. I'll explain how we are different from other places here and in India. And then we have three specialty clinics, stress clinic, pain clinic, lifestyle clinic. And, and there are subsections to it. I'll come to that in, in a minute. So this is how the whole thing is structured, and there's actual photo within the lounge. So you have stress clinic, a biofeedback studio, yoga therapy studio, pain clinic, lifestyle clinic, and nutrition clinic. Uh, one other thing that I want to focus here is we have doctors in each of these disciplines who come and practice their general OPD practice for two hours, and otherwise they're on call all the day, all through the day. And we have these Indian medicine doctors uh, who are employed in the, in the clinic. So they work together uh, as opposed to a shop-in-shop -shop approach. I have a slide for that to, to, to make those distinctions. Now, what, what is the paradigm shift that we are embracing? The, the entire world practices phys physician-centric medicine. Uh, what it means to say is that if the, my health is the responsibility of my physician. So I choose to do what I want to eat, what I want to do, what I want to think, what the way I want to live is my choice. But when I go wrong, I really don't want to do anything about my lifestyle or myself, and my doctor should just fix it through either medication or surgery. Now that used to be the practice, and, and you know we have this Bollywood movie showing, doctor, I think I'm sure all movies, physician would walk in and say, okay, I've done everything, given the medication, and uh, uh, the spouse would ask, what are, what, what are we supposed to do in terms of uh, food and other things? And the doctor would say, don't worry, he can do what he wants to do. So that used to be the, the, the medicine. And today, we are increasingly uh, recognizing that active strategies where patient has to do something for themselves to heal themselves. Uh, I have less time, so let's go uh, a little faster. So we have... What we have today across the world is physical integration. We have a number of therapists in one single place available in, in one center, but it is still patient has to make the choice. It's really not rooted or advised or prescribed. Now, what the, the process of that kind of process would be called functional integration, where of course it's all under one roof, but it is traditionally evidence-based but prescribed. Now, Further on, this is what patients are doing in the absence of a, a structured system, and this is what we are hoping to do in our center. Now, uh, allow, uh, just another point here is a, a tip, typical prescription pad looks in our clinic is where we would, we would evolve treatment objectives, and you would have prescriptions of all the treatment strategies, and the choice of that would be based on evidence. There is a first line of treatment, for example, PCOD. The medicine textbook would say that PCOD, first line of treatment, is uh, a weight loss strategy, uh, physical activity and nutrition, uh, which is yoga and naturopathy and any of those. Uh, for example, Parkinson's, they say at, at certain grade, for one full year, we can try everything else before we actually get into medication. So the first line of treatment is based on those kind of clinical guidelines. And then you will have so it could be even medication, and then the traditional medicine could be a subsidiary or supportive treatment, or the vice versa. So we have medical consultations. So what does stress clinic do? So for the first, when I Googled before we started naming this clinic, there are two stress clinics as stress clinics in the world, one in Dallas and one in Oxford, and both of them are psychiatric clinics. So in other words, people are talking about stress, but they're not really doing anything about stress before the stress-related disorders uh, are either psychiatric disorders or non-communicable disorders. So we wanted to actually evaluate. Uh, yeah. So 
so I think I really have to sum up. Uh, so this is what we do. So we have clinical events, signs and symptoms, psychometrics, physiological markers, and biochemical markers. And you get what is called stress profile. Now this is something that we have to evolve. We have some leads in each of these. And this could potentially be used to predict an onset of a lifestyle disorder or a stress-related disorder, and could also be used to predict the recovery. If somebody has already got into the disease, how long, or uh, how, what could be the milestones that we want to see in the remission or regression? Uh, I'll skip all of this. So these are the some of these domains of stress uh, the details. So these are the uh, classical uh, types of stress, and this is a, a setting where. Uh, a, a polygraph which is two channel to 16 channel can be used uh, to have the physiological markers and that's how it looks. It can also be used as a biofeedback tool. Uh, so we have biofeedback quickly one point here. We use biofeedback as biofeedback in those patients where yoga instructions cannot be given. Psychiatric patients, developmental disorders like autism, ADHD and other disorders where instructions cannot be given to these patients. So there we use biofeedback. And biofeedback is also used to demonstrate that a good breathing and a good thinking can actually, in real time, influence physiological system. So th thereby, the compliance for yoga therapy increases. And that's an issue in, in, in yoga therapy. Uh, so I think I'll skip this. Uh, we have talked enough about yoga therapy. The one thing that I wanted to, if any one of you have wondered how disease-specific yoga therapy modules are evolved, these are the three inputs. Uh, now, much of yoga therapy is done in this domain, and this is how it is done, and it can all be attributed as wellness strategy. If we want to bring it to healing, this is what we need to do. Uh, and that's what we hope to do. And we have small two yoga therapy rooms. Uh, we do small group yoga therapy sessions, about 16 sessions done every day for about eight disorders. Uh, pain clinic, uh, now typical pain clinics use either anesthesia or surgery. Uh, other than pain painkillers. Now, we have different strategies with our, with, which are called passive and active. Now, I'll come to that. So there are, okay. So there are passive pain strategies when people have acute pain, and then once that is done, you really have to get into active pain strategies where you don't really don't have a relapse of the pain. Uh, so details on that. We are the first one, or rather second one in the country to import uh, chiropractic-based spinal decompression. Now, increasingly, if some of the physical therapists are here, you know uh, in here, over here, the traction is, is not very commonly used as it used to be because we, we end up harming some of those vertebrae which is not affected. So these are the range of problems that comes by virtue of the compression of spine can, is shown to be uh, benefited by spinal decompression. So we have that. We use this in this clinic. This is the first one to, to be using in, India, in South India. And then, of course, we have active pain strategies. Now, lifestyle. Now, it's very difficult to define lifestyle clinic. Uh, so we had to first list out what are the things that the risk factors in bad lifestyle, and then define good lifestyle. And then how can it be a prescription? Uh, and then how can we define evidence to such a prescription? Uh, okay, so. Uh, talking of functional integration and lifestyle prescription. So this is the, the, the way to go, uh, where from being just palliative, which is really a vague term, we can get into the specifics where all of this makes a lot of sense. Uh, a continuation of that, probably the next one would be rehabilitation. Right? So medical and psychiatric rehabilitation is where we can use traditional medicine very, very actively. Uh, now, another thing that we do for every single patient, I'm sure most of the Ayurveda uh, physicians do this, uh, and in Yesvyasa we do this as a, as a default system. We do dosha and gunas and then start prescribing, looking for prescription. Uh, so more photos. So there is a, a big billboards like this for health education around the center because we are uh, in a nice place. Now, what are we doing? So we're coming out with a concept paper because this is what our doctors asked us uh, we, they wanted a prototype, so we have a physical clinic and we have concept papers. Now, these will be published. The position paper in terms of capacity building. Now, what we are hoping to do is we are talking with these corporate hospitals. So half of this space is required to set up a stress and lifestyle clinic in every corporate hospital. So 
if you have a stress clinic, a pain clinic, and a yoga therapy space, and uh, treatment therapy, a therapy room for Ayurveda or manipulation, that's good enough. So when a patient walks in, uh, I think, yes, <laughs> I should stop. Walks in, you really don't have to go elsewhere. So you have your endocrinologist and everything is given as a prescription. And you come out with, with a lifestyle prescription along with medication for virtually every disorder. So I close with this quote. The, the doctor of the future will give no medicine but will interest in patients the care of the human body, diet, and the cause and prevention of the disease. Interestingly, it is said by Thomas Edison. Yeah. So thank you very much.